up y'all it's me it's Greek girl Tanisha <laughs> I'm gonna do my video and I'm gonna talk about the Yoko crisis. I'm not the best at doing makeup. Like, to be honest, I kind of suck at doing makeup, but I'ma just do it anyways. Let's let's just get into it. The Yoko crisis was a, it was basically like a land dispute between the Mohawks of the Kana Sitage Reserve and the town of Oka which was beside the Kanasatagi Reserve. The Mohawk people, they stood their ground. It was a bloody day at the Mohawk Indian community in Oka, Quebec, near Montreal. Cut fire. What kind of people are you? There's children here and you're shooting tear gas at us. There was a real distinct group that wanted to like shoot it out. It united all Indian people. We're all standing as one. First time in, uh, first time in history, a matter of fact. With the crisis, it gave us pride to raise our voice, to be heard. We've been at this fight for 300 years. Oka happened for a reason. It needed to shake this country to understand that Native issues are really important, Indigenous issues are really important. It was a 78-day standoff between the Mohawk people of the Kanasatage Reserve and the Quebec Provincial Police, which in this video I'm going to be calling them the SQs. They're called something in French, but I'm, I can't say that, so I'm just going to call them the SQs, as well as the RCMP and the Army join the standoff a little later. Okay, no, let me just give you a little tiny breakdown of what happens before I start the story because it starts before Canada was even a country. So basically, the 78-day standoff happened because the town of Oka had a nine-hole golf course and they wanted to expand their nine-hole golf course into a 18-hole golf course and they also wanted to build like condos and townhouses. They wanted to build it on this area called the Pines which is where the Kanasatage people's ancestors were buried and it's also a sacred area where they like do ceremonies and they go pray there and stuff like that. Um, let me just explain the area a little bit. I guess I'll show a little map maybe. Okay, so you have the Kanasatage land like you're gonna see this on the map. Um, they have the Kanasatage Reserve. It's near the town of Oka, like it's really close. And then like, I guess the Pines is like in the middle. Oh, and it all takes place in Quebec, Canada. The Kanawage and the Kanasatage Reserves, they're just like outside Montreal. Um, so yeah, that's where this takes place in Quebec near Montreal. So anyways, yeah, let's start from the beginning of the story where um, Canada robbed the Mohawks of their sacred land and they wouldn't give it back. It begins in 1761. The Mohawk people, they first tried to get the official title to the land in 1761, but they were denied. And then again in 1851, the Mohawk people petitioned Lord Elgin, who was the governor general in 1851, but they were denied. In 1859, the province of Canada just gave the land that the Mohawks were fighting for to some French settlers. In 1910, the Mohawk people took the case to court in Quebec and they were denied it again. In 1912, the Mohawk people appealed their court case that was denied. They took it to the Judicial Committee Privy Council, which was the highest appeal court in Canada at that time. And guess what? It was denied. In 1975, three Mohawk communities, they tried to, they tried again to get Aboriginal title over this land, but it was denied because it said that they didn't have the land since time immemorial. They didn't own it, but how could they have owned it 
if the government would just not give it to them. They tried again in 1977 to make a land claim and it was denied again. It was denied because the land, because it didn't contain full legal criteria, which like, Bruh. I don't know. They just don't want to give us our land, I feel. Basically, the Mohawks have been fighting for that land for a very, 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 very long time. For hundreds of years, they've been fighting for this land. In 1961, a nine-hole golf course was built on part of the pines. It was very close, but it wasn't on to the Mohawks burial site. In 1989, the mayor of Oka, Dean Ouellette, wanted to expand the golf course to an 18 hole golf course and he wanted to build it in the pines on top of the burial grounds and he also wanted to build like the condos and the townhouses on top of the burial grounds yeah the mohawks they were not having it they were like fuck that y'all are not doing that not here since the land was not technically owned by the Mohawk people. They were not consulted at all. No one told them about it. They just planned to start construction in March of 1990. Uh, like I said, the Mohawks, they were not with this. They did not like that plan. So in 1989 and in 1990, the Mohawk people, they like tried to go about it all the right ways. They tried to peacefully protest. They did petitions. They went to the city council of Oka to try to talk to them and tell them like they don't want them building a golf course on their where their ancestors are buried. The town of Oka did not listen to the Mohawk people. When did they ever listen to the native? A group of people from the Kanasatage Reserve, they built a barricade and they didn't let the construction workers go into the pines to start building. The group of people were protesters along with some warriors, some Mohawk warriors. Kanasatage people, they built a blockade and they didn't let the, they didn't let anyone go onto the pines to start building the golf course they were just like fuck that if you guys aren't gonna listen to us we're gonna sit our asses here and you're not getting by us i put that on my life that's what they said in april of 1990 that was in march they set up the barricade and then in april they the town of oka they got a court injunction to get the mohawk people out of there they got the courts to tell them to get out of there. Well, they were served two court injunctions at the barricade, which they just ignored. They were like, I don't care. I don't care about your fucking court injunction. I'm still going to stay here and protect the land. But the town of Oka got the Quebec Provincial Police to go to go try to dismantle the blockade and like to just go stop the Mohawk people from what they were doing. Like they were stopping the construction. So they wanted the Ontario Provincial Police to go in there and like get the Mohawks out so that they continue, they can continue with construction. After the police were called, the SQ, the Mohawks, they, st they started creating a plan because like they knew that the SQs were going to be called because they ignored the two injunctions. So they kind of had an idea that the cops would show up, but they didn't know when. So they just started planning like what they're going to do when the cops showed up. So their plan was to have the woman in the front, like to meet the... SQ, try to negotiate with them maybe, tell them to f*** off, and then the warriors were going to be at the back of the woman in case the SQ did not f*** off, and then the warriors could come and back them up, you know? I don't like this color of eyeshadow. I have hooded eyes, by the way, so if I'm doing my makeup f***ed up, I have hooded eyes, and like, makeup does not work for me. On July 10 of 1990, someone told the Mohawks that the SQ planned to raid them the next day on July 11th. They were planning to raid their barricade, so the Mohawk people started preparing. They started setting booby traps and stuff in the bushes. Like they were, they were putting fish hooks on knee-high branches, like to hit the cops in the knees. And then they were like tying things on the trees, lines, so that they could trip the cops. Also, I might want to mention that the warriors that I mentioned before, who were behind the women, they had guns. On July 
11, 1990, as expected, the barricade was raided. The SQ came in heavily armed and they attacked the protesters, the women who were at the front, with tear gas and concussion grenades. Provincial police arrived at dawn, secured their position, and gave the Mohawk until 8 to clear out. But the natives stood their ground. The battle for the barricade started just before 9 o'clock. And heavily armed provincial police bobbed tear gas and stun grenades. What kind of people are you? There's children here and you're shooting tear gas at us. The tear gas that they tried to throw at the woman, it, the wind was blowing this way towards back towards the SQ. So the SQ got tear gassed from their own tear gas. So Mother Earth was on our side. Period. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just fucking around. What is that? This is going to look very nice, okay? Um, it doesn't look nice right now, but... As I mentioned, these warriors were armed, so after the women and other protesters got tear gassed, the warriors were there waiting for the SQ to come. And then the warriors, they got into a shootout with the SQ. One of the members of the SQ got shot. His name was... I got the name wrong of the SQ who got shot. This is him. His name is Marcel LeMay. It's not known who he was shot by. It wasn't known if he was shot by uh, one of the Mohawk warriors or one of the SQs. Like, it could have been either side that shot him. It's also unknown who started the shootout, like who shot first, the Mohawks or the SQ. After one of the SQ guys was shot, the SQs retreated and left. And then the Mohawks, they stayed at the barricade and they continued to protect the land. And that's when the 77 day standoff began on July 11th. On the same day, July 11th, 1990 another group of mohawks called the kanawage well, the mohawks of the kanawage reserve decided to help the mohawks of the kanasatage reserve by blocking off a bridge in quebec it's called the mercier bridge basically the main route into montreal from the suburbs outside of montreal like 100,000 people use that bridge every single day to get to work in montreal the kanawage mohawks they helped out the kanasatage people they stood in solidarity with them by blocking off the mercier bridge that placed pressure on the quebec government now all the non-natives are like pissed off because they can't get to work so obviously the government will listen to them so that puts pressure on the quebec government to like stop trying to build on the pine so that the bridge can open again so yeah there was a lot of outrage because of that which was actually a pretty smart move my makeup is not looking good if i'm gonna be honest right after the blockade at the mercier bridge it kind of did put um pressure on the quebec government because negotiations started with the Mohawk people. What the Mohawk people wanted was official title to the Pines and they wanted that official title to be recognized in the International Court of Justice. And they also wanted the police to get out of their communities because the police were like in their in the Kanasage and Kanasatage reserves. They were like in there being intimidating and and the Mohawk people also wanted full sovereignty. All of these demands were denied by the provincial and federal government. So the Mohawks were like, well, we're gonna stay here then. In mid-July, the RCMP was brought in to help the SQ, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police, which is like the federal police, the bad guys. Just kidding. <laughs> Also, the Quebec Premier, Robert Bourassa, he also wanted the army to come and help the SQ take down the Mohawks. So yeah, the federal government sent the army. As promised, the army rolled into Oka and Chateauguay today. From here on in, I guess we're going to be burying each other. The warriors were nearing hysteria at the sight of soldiers near their tribal cemetery. Run! Shoot! Get him out of here! Shoot! Back. The warriors calmed oh. down, although not much, and they took to taunting the soldiers face to face. Nervous, perhaps? Do you think? 
You nervous? On August 20, 1990, over 4,000 soldiers were deployed to Quebec and they took position in and around the communities, Kanawage and Kanasatage. When the army came, they brought a bunch of hardcore ass weapons and shit. They, they brought, they brought like army trucks, they brought tanks, they brought jets artillery units that's those big ass guns i had to google that shit i'm gonna put tape on my eyes because like i like my eyeshadow to like go out this way because like my eyes are like i don't want my eyeshadow to be going up like this way which that's happening because like i want it to go this way because that looks better on my eyes i don't know riots happened in shadowway which was a non-indigenous town outside of montreal near the the kanawage reserve and the people in Shadowway, they were pissed because of the blockades because the people of Shadowway couldn't get to work. So they had a riot demanding that the army go in there and dismantle the blockade and end all of this once and for all. The army and the police had to go settle that down. More blockades started popping up all across Canada. I'm pretty sure there was a rally here in Winnipeg. There was a a few blockades mm -hmm. in BC blocking off these important railways and roadways. These railways are extremely vital to Canada, like to Canada's economy because the railways are how they transport the goods that across the country and stuff like food, anything that you can buy. They're transported through roadways and railways if they can't transport them across the country the economy will start going down because like the stuff is not being sold it's not being transported kind of reminds me of when the Wet'suwet'en people i believe they didn't want anyone building on their land a pipeline a pipeline they didn't want a pipeline on their land so they protested and then there was a bunch of solidarity blockades across canada and like the government was had a lot of pressure on them to stop because the economy would fail without these railways that the native people were blocking so that shows you how much power we actually have across the country when we work together so that also really i thought was really cool anyways a bunch of blockades and rallies happened all over canada like in solidarity with the mohawks of kanasatage on august 29 1990 negotiations were be were able to be made with the kanawage people who were blocking the mercier bridge mm -hmm. and they agreed to dismantle their blockade on the bridge they didn't actually dismantle it until September 6 mm -hmm. of 1990 so they held on for like another week after they agreed mm -hmm. to dismantle it I have no idea what I'm mm -hmm. doing but like I'm trying I'm trying my best here y'all looking a little better after the Kanawage people agreed to dismantle their their blockade the army started to advance into the Kanasatake's barricade at the pines like they raided it 30 men and 16 women and six children they retreated from the barricade into a a building that was used as a treatment center it was just across the road from the pines they continued to negotiate with the the government and the army and their plan was to try and stay there and hold out until September 24 of 1990 because that's when, that's when Parliament was going to resume on September 24, 1990 because Parliament was on a recess for the summer and then they wanted to stay there until September 24 because they were hoping that the Parliament would listen to them and negotiate better with them than what Quebec was doing. On September 18, the SQ and the army, they were dropped off by helicopter on the Takakwitha Island, which is on the outskirts of the Kanawage Reserve, and they were met by hundreds of Mohawk people. September 18th, Takakwitha Island, the western edge of the village. The army is landing in force. It looks as if they are about to cross the bridge and invade the community. But no one explains 
why all these troops are needed. There are no answers. There is a lot of anger. One officer would later tell reporters, the strong resistance surprised us. It was amazing the way they reacted since we weren't at the Longhouse or a sacred place. What the army didn't understand is that Mohawks believe that the land itself is sacred. Now, I saw you go after one of the guys. Oh, no, that, no, no, but just your feeling of what sparked that. Anger. They have no business here. If they're acting under the direction of the provincial government, they have no business here whatsoever. And they're to get out now. They've already been served their eviction notice. They're past due to leave here. The politics of this community is that we are, we are sovereign people. We are Mohawk Nation people. This is our jurisdiction. We will make our own laws over here, and, you know, and the government doesn't want that. The government says, no, you have to obey, you have to obey provincial law, federal law, etc., etc., etc. That's what's behind this. This is another turning point in the crisis. The army will announce it has done its job, and it intends to go home. Uh, this was known as the Peacock with the Island standoff. So after seven hours, the SQ and the army got picked up by helicopter. 22 soldiers were injured and 75 Mohawk people were injured in this fight. All the people who were injured were ranged in age from five years old to 72 years old. So they were fighting babies and elders. Good job, Canada, good job. Anyways, Parliament resumed on September 24, and the Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, he agreed to hear what the Mohawks had to say. And the people who were in the treatment center I was talking about across the road from the Pines, they stayed in there until September 24. On September 6, they left from that treatment center without, like, telling the army that they were coming and they left really suddenly. Like, they didn't make a formal announcement. I guess that scared the army. The first few Mohawks out of the compound just started down the hill towards the town of Oka. Hey, this guy's got a knife! Stop! Then warriors began to emerge, showing defiance instead of surrendering to the army as they were expected to do. The Mohawks who managed to get through the army lines walked smack into the arms of the waiting Quebec police. <laughs> The army said there were over 50 people taken away from the warrior camp, including 23 warriors. They had those rifles with knives at the end of them, like the knives at the end of the rifles. So they were like fucking going around with those, even though there was a bunch of kids there. There was a 14-year-old girl. Her name was Juanique Horn. Miller and she got stabbed. She got stabbed by the by the army. She was coming out of the treatment center. Her mom was one of the negotiators. She was coming out of the treatment center with her mom and she was carrying her little sister. Her little sister was four years old. One of the army soldiers stabbed her with in the chest with um their rifle and with a knife at the end of it. Like, can you imagine being a 14-year-old young girl and getting stabbed by the army? What blows my mind is that all of this happened over a golf course and condos. It's always about something stupid like that, like a pipeline, golf course, condos, hydro dams. It's all in the name of capitalism. They didn't, they didn't expand the golf course. They ended up not going through with that. So the Mohawk people were victorious. They, they won their fight with determination and a braveness. Also with solidarity, the solidarity of other natives too. Like the, the Kanawagis. I thought that was so cool. Like that was one of my favorite, my favorite moments in history because 
like it's a perfect example of indigenous resistance ever since canada was a country they've been stepping all over us doing us dirty tricking us deceiving us doing us so wrong abusing us taking our livelihood destroying our communities destroying our animals and water taking away our children abusing our children murdering our children it's apparent that canada does not like native people and like they don't respect our values which we very much value the land because the land takes care of us the land is what we get everything we need from we get our food from the land the animals live on the land like mother earth she can provide us with anything and these people just want to keep building on it and destroying her and making her sick and we never wanted that it's like a spiritual connection as well which is what i think the mohawks had with the pines i thought it was so cool how the government was like just trying to step all over them and then they're like nope you're not gonna do that not nope we've had enough if you're not gonna listen to us we're gonna fucking make you hold on wait let me put my eyelashes on okay okay i put on my eyelashes and it doesn't look that bad okay i was getting totally worried because like my makeup was looking so ugly for a second but it looks fine it looks fine yeah i hope you liked that video i hope i did a good job explaining it yeah that was a really cool thing that i learned about history um, i know a lot of things about native history because i have a general bachelor of arts degree and my major was native studies so maybe i'll do another video depending on if this video goes okay i said in one of my other videos that i wanted to do a video about the 215 children and like residential schools in canada but i'm not sure that i want to do that like i tried and i kept crying it's just really hard for native people to talk about residential schools like especially right now like we're basically being re-traumatized by all of this stuff coming back up all these mass graves being found outside residential schools all the children's bodies being found um it's very traumatic to native people so yeah i applaud any native person who is able to talk about it without crying i still cry almost every time but maybe someday i'll be strong enough to make a video about residential schools but not right now that's why i did this video about the oka crisis because it was more of a powerful time in native history yeah i don't know maybe i'll do my next video on like I'll figure something out anyways. I hope you liked this video. I hope it made sense. I hope you found the Oka crisis interesting because I do unless I'm just some kind of history nerd. But yeah, I don't know. I really love indigenous history. So I'm just going to talk about it anyways. Like and subscribe.